engineer the protocol, you can be one of both sides. So it enables you to play around with malformed protocol attacks. It enables you to do brute force in case there is a password. It gives you all the functionality you need to script it. For the enterprise server, if you have a successful attack, you get code execution on a host OS. Um, and that means you own a server that's centrally placed um, in an infrastructure. Um, to give you an idea of what the, what the enterprise server actually does is like someone comes in with a box to your company and, and places the box there and, and you ask, what is it? Like the security, chief security officer asks, what is this box? And, well, it's an enterprise server for Blackberries. The CEO wants it. And so what does it do? Um, it connects out to the internet to RIM. Fine. And what else does it do? Well, it connects to our mail system and needs administrative access on it. Um, so that should pretty much clarify how much impact a code execution attack on such a system would have. Um, for, the, for the management tools, you could modify policies. You could modify the configuration if you own them. Um, you could send messages to everyone, and you may be able to install software on all the Blackberries that are managed by this enterprise server. So like all the board gets porn screensavers or whatnot. This means you can draw up a, a graph or a diagram and like put in all the connections that you have here and see how easy is the access to it on one side, and what's the impact? And if you place those things, then it becomes pretty clear what your research should concentrate on. Because, like, as I said, the enterprise server is easily accessible. It is Windows-based, so we have all the debug infrastructure. We don't have to solder stuff to a device or something. Um, it is centrally placed. It will probably have access to everyone's email, not just one, one account. Um, and well, code execution is fine. You have like Metasploit and everything. You don't even need custom shell codes. And well, you can own a pretty interesting machine inside a corporate network. And this should show why going right after the handheld device will be a very, very stupid idea. Now, once you get the big picture, you need to get the details right. Um, because the details are what matters if, to make the big picture correct. Otherwise, you end up having a big picture which depicts not the system you're attacking, but something similar. Um, so details decide, for example, how hard will it be to find a usable attack for that. So you have to like, take the enterprise server binaries, throw them into IDA, and see if IDA is going to puke on them. Um, because there, there are situations where IDA is not very helpful. Um, just name like Delphi code um, where IDA just really sucks. Um, what tools do you need for your work? Like, as I said, we need a working installation. How feasible is the attack in general? Like, what can I, if I have an attack on a specific piece of software um, that handles, in this case, email messages, can I reach this piece of software, or is it hidden some, somewhere in the enterprise network? In case of email, it's fairly obvious. You can send email to everyone you want. But still, you have to consider that for the general case. And then how illegal is the attack? Meaning, do I have to own an entire provider network to execute the attack? Or, and that's not for the research site, but for the actual execution of the attack. Or do I just send an email? So um, for the handheld devices, um, the details were fairly interesting because there is a simulation environment available, which helps a lot. Um, there is a developer SDK available. Um, the current version is for Java. The older version is for C, which of course was a lot more interesting looking at. Um, but it had a limitation in accessibility, meaning that only residents of the United States and Canada could get to it. That's what a website said. This is a case where accessibility wasn't really an issue. I mean, even I know people in the US, and even I can call them and say, look, could you like send a fax over to RIM and get this SDK for me? Thank you. Um, you have desktop software, um, and you have third-party code. 
that's like third party products that you can put on a Blackberry, which is again quite useful because you can take the third party products, make more or less legal copies of it, um, and like see what's in there. Like what API do, do they use? What can they do with the API? Because that tells you what, how much power you have behind the API, even if you don't have documentation for it. For the protocols, um, it's really just firing up the sniffer and finding out how many communication channels do we actually have. Like, does it connect to 500 different systems in the internet, or is it just one? How does it figure out what system to connect to? Um, who initiates the connection? Is it stateless or is stateful? Um, is it connection oriented? Um, how much encapsulation do we see or suspect? When you look at the protocols and you have a protocol that has lots of encapsulation levels, then the code parsing that is probably in a, in a tree-like structure. So you have a parser for the outer encapsulation, then it figures out what's in there, then you have a parser for the next level of encapsulation, and so on and so on and so on. Um, which means that probably a lot of people are working on this code and not really talking to each other because you can modularize it really easy in development. On the other side, if you have a flat, big protocol thing, then the parser is probably written by one crazy Russian um, and is one huge piece of code. Without doing lots of reverse engineering, by looking at the protocol, you can at least guess how much work it's going to be or how likely it is that you find useful attacks. And how var variable is the protocol design? Example, um, SAP uses like strict fixed length protocols that have like fixed length fields. There's pretty much nothing in this damn protocol that you can overflow because it's all fixed to eight characters. So on a service software, how is the software designed? Are we running user land, service, kernel? Um, what security context do we have? What privileges does the software need? Um, <coughs> especially if you have multiple modules of the software, um, different processes, you have to look, okay, I have like five processes. One is running as nobody, one is running as system, um, two are kernel drivers or whatever, um, and then figure out what those things are doing. And the best case combination, meaning high level of privilege and much exposure to the outside, is the one you're gonna look at. I mean, the enterprise software comes on a CD, I think it's 300 something megabytes or something. But if you go for a software that's big enough to not fit into IDA completely, um, you have to decide where to go. Otherwise you're researching till you're 80 and, and the software is outdated for 20 years or something. Um, and of course, as I said, what programming language um, was used is very important. But also what coding style do we see? Do we see like, university style slept together C++ or um, do we see um, Russian e-technician code where variables probably never had more than two characters? What coding style is there? Because that tells you again um, what types of bugs to expect. Things to look for. Um, history is very important and very powerful if you just take half a day surfing the company's website and, and press releases. Um, where does this stuff come from? Did they bought the technology? Did they invent it? How old is it? What generations were there in between? Um, check the press releases. And then documentation, what are like setup requirements? What do you have to have? Like probably you have to be administrator to install it, but um, like on, in which context does the machine run? Um, what troubleshooting procedures are recommended if something doesn't work? What troubleshooting procedures are actually used? Forums are, web 2.0 is really good for that because like people are posting all this stuff on the internet saying, yeah, troubleshooting procedure doesn't work, I just reboot the machine. Or other people say, I just reinstall the software. That gives you a very good idea of how the level of administrators is working with this stuff. So if nothing else, it tells you how likely it is that they get, get to you when you own them. Um, and whatever you read, um, take it as a hint, not as a fact. So, like, the third step then is <laughs> what you can't really do a presentation on is do the actual work, um, which can be quite painful, and, you know, everyone has different ways of dealing with that. Um, well, and then, somehow, you get two results, hopefully. So, first things for the handheld was um, strip it. Um, yeah, you're, you're not buying cats in a bag, so... Um, <laughs> 
before you marry a female, you probably do the same thing. Um, so, <laughs> so we wanted to figure out what's actually in there um, because it turned out to be a re really, really useful move um, and it actually wasn't really our idea. Um, Frank Rieger from CCC came up with that. Um, he said, well, before you start reverse engineering the binaries, you should better figure out what CPU it is. And it turns out that was really good because the, the simulation environment still worked on a 386 um, type of architecture, which they used in really early handheld um, devices that more looked like a pager. But then later on, they moved over to ARM, embedded in an, um, I think it's analog devices um, over here on an ARM CPU. So we knew it was an ARM CPU. Um, when you turn the thing around, um, that's the front view. That's not very interesting. Um, <coughs> so as I said, turns out to be ARM. Um, it runs different real-time operating systems, um, or real-time operating system kernels, I should say. Um, for example, the 7290 uh, um, runs on a KDAC um, AMX4 kernel, which <laughs> turned out to be a surprise even to some people from RIM. <laughs> Um, other, other devices run on entirely RIM proprietary code, but it's different for each and every model. So we have the same situation as with Cisco here. Again, that tells us that writing an exploit for the lower level kernel um, areas would be not a very smart idea because you would have an exploit for a specific type of device and not for the whole range. Um, the binary images, um, do the actual near hardware communication, like GSM implementation and stuff. You don't, not even RIM implements that in Java. And then you have loadable modules, which is quite an interesting concept. What they do is they use DLL files, regular PE COF format, like we have on Windows, um, just compiled for the ARM architecture, which is totally doable. Um, and they're, they link into the main operating system binary, which is called RIMOS EXE. Um, so there are, there is a modular architecture in there, so there might be the possibility to add modules or change module loading or stuff like that. And then you have the handheld JVM, the virtual machine, um, which is implemented as one of those loadable modules. So you have a JVM.dll that's actually flashed onto the device. Um, RIM actually re-implemented the entire JVM. So Whatever um, is there on fixed Java bugs in JVMs from Sun or from HP, okay, sorry, HP doesn't fix bugs, um, IBM or so, someone else, um, it might actually work at the RIM JVM or they might have different bugs. So it's really interesting to know that there is a specific JVM. Unfortunately, the classes set is not very big, um, especially the reflection API is missing, um, so you can't really play interesting tricks with them. Um, device control runs over RIM classes. So you have a set of classes, RIM dot blah, 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 um, that do all the device control. They display messages um, on the screen. You can do whatever you want functionality-wise on a BlackBerry as a developer. Unfortunately, um, if you don't use RIM classes, if you limit yourself to the Java classes, um, you can't do anything. I mean, what you can do is like add two numbers or something, but you can't even do input or output. So you have to use the RIM classes, um, which kind of sucks because there, um, you have to use signed code to actually um, import RIM classes or link to RIM.